We're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here with Jeff Kelly, and this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's production of MIT's cyber politics, cyber security event. Uh, it's actually got a great name. I have to, I have to do it justice here. So it's the, it's the Explorations in Cyber International Relations. It's the Cybersecurity and the Governance Gap, Complexity, Contention, and Cooperation. Uh, this is the fourth such workshop, and essentially bringing together uh, the best thinkers, uh, people in public policy, people in industry, to really try to keep pace with the um, innovations that are going on in cybersecurity, with the threats, and balancing essentially the, the threats with uh, the other side of the equation, which is value. Adam Siegel is here. He's the Maurice R. Greenberg Senior Fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Adam, welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Now, we've heard a lot today about the, the rapid pace of, 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 of cyber development, cyberspace, uh, and, and what's going on there, and how international relations have not kept pace. Um, you guys are you know, a very well-known think tank on this topic. Um, what's your take on all this? Um, and then we'll get into China. Well, I think uh, foreign policy actually is probably one of the worst in keeping up with, with, with what's happening. Uh, cyber is one of those issues that goes across you know, security issues, diplomacy, trade. Uh, bureaucratically, we are organized for the industrial age. We're not industrial, organized for the information age. And uh, most foreign policy elite tend to be not digital native, they tend to be older. Uh, and haven't really seen the importance of these values. So I think we're beginning to see the closing of that gap, um, a kind of a narrowing between how foreign policy people think about this and how civil society, business, and all the others are really uh, driving uh, internet forward. So what, 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 what do we, can, we can learn from the in industrial age? So um, the Council on Foreign Relations was formed, what, in the, in the 20s. 20s? Okay, and so coming into the industrial revolution, <laughs> Was, were foreign relations as well sort of behind back then, and what was what, what was done? What can we learn from that uh, from that history, if anything? Well, there's there's a there's a great example right after the end of World War II in 1947, where the U.S. had the, na the new National Security Act that helped uh, put in place uh, the institutions and policies for the Cold War. Right, we had a clear enemy, the Soviet Union. We had a strategy of containment. Right, not only allowing the uh, the Soviets to expand their influence or their military. And we set up the institutions in place, right? We had the Defense Department that was to defend uh, the U.S. homeland. We had the State Department. We created the National Security Council to help coordinate the creation of the Central Intelligence Agencies. We had the creation of what were called Title 10 and Title 50 and Title 18 responsibilities, which had to do with domestic uh, and foreign kind of responsibilities. Well, cyber, all of that doesn't hold any longer, right? The threat is not always on the outside, right? Attacks may come from China, but they could be routed through networks in the United States. Um, the, the threat might not be a non, may be a non-state actor. It may not be China. It may be what's called patriotic hackers, right? Guys who are doing things on their own. Um, the threat is economic and national security. So all of these uh, original kind of bureaucratic divisions that we made, uh, that made sense then, are much harder to kind of fit into the into the threats we're dealing with now. So, um, and, and you mentioned, you, you gave an example of some folks acting independently, right. and, and oftentimes you don't know whether they're acting, you know, with the guidance of the state or not. So that's got to make it harder to collaborate on a global basis if there's no trust. So, um, which brings me to, to China. There's always, there's always a lot of rhetoric thrown back and forth between the, particularly the U.S. and, and, and China. Um, what's the state, you know, from your perspective of those relations as it specifically relates to, to cybersecurity? I would say trust is pretty low, right? We, um, and that's probably being generous, right? Um, we, we had, you kind of have to look at Snowden, uh, before Snowden and after Snowden, right? So in the lead up to Snowden in, in June, right, the U.S. had been uh, mounting a very aggressive public campaign of uh, naming and shaming China as uh, the biggest threat to the U.S. on cyber espionage, right? The biggest threat to U.S. intellectual property. And what we, what we saw over time was a kind of general escalation of what U.S. government officials were willing to say, right? So it used to be in the old days, right, when the Google attack happened yep. in, in, in January of 2010, that what, what happened was Google said we were attacked by a very sophisticated state actor. Had to be China. Right, and then everybody would say, well, it had to be China, and the press would call me, and I would say it's China. 
but the US government officials would just say it's a state-based actor. Yeah. Well, what happened uh, in the spring uh, of 2013 is that the US government officials started saying, it's China, right? So we had a speech from uh, Secretary and National Security Advisor Tom Donilon uh, in April that said, it's China. Then we had this uh, big summit between President Xi and President Obama. It was supposed to be a chance for them to get to know each other um, in kind of a casual atmosphere in sunny lands, California, and Obama was going to push this issue of cyber espionage and, and say to the Chinese, look, uh, everyone spies, we realize that. Um, but the type of spying that you're doing, the, the, the attacking and stealing of US intellectual property, that is really undermining the international trade uh, regime and our bilateral relationship. So if you guys want to move forward on this, we really have to settle this problem. And then Snowden happens. So Snowden comes out and, and there's these revelations both of you know, US broad surveillance, but also there seems to be these instances where the US seems to be spying, if not for economic reasons, focused on economic organizations for national security reasons. So the, 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 the most prominent example was the spying on Petrobras, the Brazilian uh, energy company which the U.S. would say, well, of course, we have to know about national oil markets, but it's not for economic reasons. It's not to help U.S. companies. But that, that distinction is really lost on the Chinese. And so what you've seen um, since the NSA revelations is a really a ramping of rhetoric on the Chinese side, which says, yeah, we know who the biggest threat in cyberspace is. It's you. It's the United States. Uh, and everybody else sees that now, too. So is this a, a, a cyber arms race that we've now you know, kicked off? Can you, can you draw parallels to the space race? Uh, there is clearly, there's some action and reaction going on, right? The, the Chinese like to point out, well, you know, who were the first ones to militarize cyberspace? It was the United States. You, you guys set up Cyber Command, and we, we're, we're the ones that are backwards, and we, we're trying to catch up. Um, I don't think we're at the place, we're not in a Cold War yet, right? Because as you, I think you hinted at it earlier, right? The relationship between us and the Chinese is just vastly different than it was with the Soviets, right? We had. 1% of our international trade is with the Eastern Bloc. You know, China uh, is one of our largest trading partners. Uh, they are sitting on you know, a huge amount of foreign exchange. Um, US companies do all of their sourcing in China. So we clearly are competitive in many uh, instances, but we are also cooperating in a whole range of issues. Um, kind of building up that, that, that last answer, how, what is the state of kind of or I should say, what is the impact of foreign relations outside of the cyber realm? Uh, what is the impact on, on the relationship between China and the US when it comes to cyber relations? In other words, do outside factors, other uh, situations, other um, uh, concerns impact the way that the two com countries can cooperate on cyber governance and security? They, they do in, the, in that um, cyber, you could, you could say, right, if, if you believe, for example, what General Alexander was saying, that this intellectual, the theft of this intellectual property was the largest transfer in wealth in human history, then, then you'd imagine, well, the U.S. would kick this up to, you know, number one or number two when we deal with China, right? Why, why aren't we making this the most important issue if this is threatening our national uh, economic well-being? But in fact, because we have a whole range of other issues we want to work with the Chinese on, uh, North Korea, Iran, global climate change, uh, the global economy, that cyber was pushed down fairly, fairly uh, low. And so it, it's an important issue. It's not the, the main issue. I think um, more broadly, um, you know, the Chinese believe that the United States is working in some way or another to undermine the regime. Uh, we do that through, you know, a whole range of things. And cyber for them is a big part of that, mm -hmm. right? the free flow of information, Twitter, Facebook, which of course are not allowed in China, but they see that as threats to domestic stability and regime legitimacy. So that makes uh, cooperation on a whole range of issues uh, harder. Uh, we also have a different sense of how the internet should be governed. Right? The US has been promoting this bottom-up, private sector kind of model, but the Chinese from the very beginning, they said, no, cyberspace is just like everywhere else. It's a, it's a, so it's a sovereign realm, and states should play a large role in it. So, so we've been hearing a lot today, uh, this morning, in some of the earlier um, presentations about the need for the kind of a multilateral, multi-stakeholder approach to yeah. governance. Um, does China's approach that it's a the cyberspace is a sovereign area for them to control? Does that leave them out of that equation? Is there any hope for bringing states like China into a multi-stakeholder uh, governance environment? Uh, it's going to be hard. Uh, I mean, the Chinese. Uh, as you probably heard earlier, have been suspicious of ICANN and all the other multi-stake organizations. 
you know, they point to the Department of Commerce's contract with ICANN. Um, they are uh, not um, that familiar with how the organizations work and how they can be involved. But they are involved in these more multilateral institutions like the ITU and others. Um, you know, the, the thing about, the, about China is, um, you know, cliche to say is, of course, is that it's changing so dramatically. And so what I think we will see over time and we're beginning to see is that, you know, Chinese companies, as they globalize, have uh, a stake in an open, interoperable, transparent system, right? If you're a Chinese company and you're thinking about standards, you know, even though the Chinese government is pushing for its own indigenous innovation and its own technological, technological standards, you may like that in the early years of growth, right, when you need to compete with uh, U.S. Uh, technology firms. But when you think about globalizing, you actually want global standards, right? You want to be involved in d d designing those standards. And so we see companies like Lenovo, right, which is much more involved in a lot of this international technology standard setting. And you could imagine as the Chinese economy becomes more globalized that it would try to help develop in that way. Uh, does that potentially open them up to more risks in cyberspace? Um, it seems to me there's, you know, on the one hand, one area to kind of improve relations between two countries is to focus on some of the mutual right. risks. Um, but it seems if China has essentially tried to wall itself off from some of those risks, maybe there isn't as much overlap or as much area for co cooperation. Um, but if, as you say, um, China begins to open up a little bit to allow their uh, enterprises and organizations to start taking a larger role in cyber governance, um, does that offer some opportunities where there are mutual risks, non-state actors, for example, that could target the U.S. or China? Yeah. I think, I think it does. I think the question is, how long does it take us to get there, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think um, if you read a lot of the Chinese analysts about uh, the U.S., they, they tend to see us as being much more vulnerable, right? We're more open, we're more dependent. The U.S. military is more net-centric. And so when they think about cyber as a weapon, they really still see it as an asymmetric weapon, one that's going to hurt us more than it would hurt them. But that is clearly changing, right? The Chinese economy is becoming more internet enabled. The Chinese are very worried about uh, critical infrastructure, um, SCADA systems and PLC and all of those, and Stuxnet you know, did worry them that this was going to be a vulnerability for them. Uh, and the Chinese military is you know, trying to look more and more like the US military. So um, you can imagine that they would be vulnerable to the types of attacks that the US military would be vulnerable to. But couldn't, couldn't you argue that the, the, the state of their infrastructure, because it's for so many cases starting with the blank sheet of paper, is is more modernized and somewhat less vulnerable because it, it, some of those security aspects are going to be designed in, or is that a fallacy? Uh, it theoretically would give you the blank slate to, to, um, to leapfrog to the next, gen next generation, but uh, Chinese writings don't suggest that that's what's happening. Right? They seem pretty worried about what they're doing, and uh, much like the critique you hear about, you know, we're building the smart grid without any security built into it, you, you see the same thing, the same worries in China. that. They haven't really been thinking of security built in. They've been thinking about how you attach it on afterwards. So we're all screwed. Basically. Well, that, <laughs> but that's probably true. But then again, that you know, one of the um, reasons why we had stability is because we had mutual vulnerability, yeah. right? And so there is some hope that with the Chinese, if you get to this point where we, where we are both screwed, then maybe you s find some things, common things to work on, and and. Uh, Third-party attacks, non-state actors, is one that I have suggested in several times that we said, well, you know, neither uh, the Chinese nor us have any interest in Al-Qaeda or any other group developing these capabilities. And so is this a, an area for us to work together? Has the Chinese content, you may or may not know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway, has the content filtering system become um, more sophisticated over the years? I, I got the sense that China's censorship was like a blunt instrument. Yeah. They didn't like it, boom is shut it right off, but but it would seem that with the state of, you know, technological advancements, they could get more selective, and it would be in their best interest to do so because they could foster innovation and, and their yeah. economy. Do you have any visibility on that? Yeah, so it, it has, um, there have been several studies done um, uh, out of uh, Canada and some other places that look at, technologically, it has become much more sophisticated. Uh, they don't have to do as much um, blunt, you know, blocking. They can block certain stories, um, and there was a very interesting study actually done uh, down the river at Harvard here, which shows that in fact, what a lot of what is self censored on Weibo, which is you know, the Chinese Twitter equivalent, uh, is not necessarily criticism of the government. Right. So in fact, you can criticize the government uh, in some instances. What is censored is uh, attempts to organize. 
So if you criticize the government and just kind of say, you know, this is bad, this is bad, then you're, you're usually left alone. If you say this is bad and we should all meet up next week, then that gets taken down. So there's a very kind of sophisticated attempt to make sure that discontent uh, isn't converted into any political action, but you're still allowed to air discontent. And the Chinese have been fairly open in saying, you know, we don't have a great mechanism for finding out what our people are really worried about. And so th the internet actually s does that for us, lets us know what they're pissed off about, and allows us to respond. Did you, I uh, presume you were here this morning with uh, Fadi Chahani, and uh, talk about, you know, Brazil as sort of the great equalizer, I'll, yeah. I'll call it. Um, well, what about a, a counter proposal? What if we just create an oligopoly of, uh, of, of cyber governance and just mm -hmm. get the big guys, yeah. you know, all the big guns to play? I mean, you know, U.S., China, you know, Russia, yeah. maybe throwing you know, the EU. What, what do you think about that? That's actually the Indians were very worried about that for a while. <laughs> that 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 the U.S. Uh, and China were going to kind of divide the world amongst them. There was for a while there was this idea about a G2, a group of two that was going to be popular. Um, I just don't see it happening with China. We just, we, while, you know, people will point out that we share all these um, kind of common interests, which is true, right? We, we all have, for the most part, China is still a status quo power. Um, it's interested in the international economy working the way that it has been. Um, do, doesn't really want Iran to be nuclear. Doesn't really want North Korea to be nuclear. But when it comes right down to brass tacks, we, we don't agree about how we should do that, and the priorities are different. So I, I don't see that happening. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you heard the analogies uh, earlier today um, of, of, about you know, sort of nuclear uh, pro proliferation. Um, and I've, I've pointed out several times today, that scares me, right. because um, it's a lot more complex than it was back in the 1970s. Um, what are your thoughts about that, that those, those parallels and the complexity that we have facing us going forward? Well, it's in on one hand, it's a, a slightly um, optimistic uh, example because the Chinese uh, were actually pretty bad about proliferation, right? In the in the 70s and certainly under Mao, they used to say, well, proliferation, uh, non-proliferation regimes are were put in place by the Western countries to keep poor countries down, and of course we're going to spread nuclear technology to the third world, and that's going to help all of us. And so, uh, in the 80s, we saw the Chinese were selling missile technology and nuclear technology to Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and to all these places. What happened in the late 80s and early 90s was where they finally realized, well, actually, this isn't so great for us, right? A, a, a nuclear arm Pakistan that's destabilized is a threat to us as well. And so you, over time, you saw a kind of change in mindset with the, with the Chinese. They're still not perfect, right? We still see some um, slippage on Iran and North Korea, but they're much, much better than they were before. So it's possible and with uh, cyber weapons that they'll have a kind of similar mind change. They'll say, you know what, this kind of proliferation of these uh, malware and vulnerabilities is bad for us, too. But it took them a long way time to get there. Um, and also, we were in a much different position with China in the 70s and 80s. We, we still had something the Chinese wanted. Mm. Right? We still had WTO access. We still had access to the market. It's so hard to th think of things that we, we have now that they want. Do you see, um, do you see China exporting um, uh, security? technology, def defensive technologies, or even offensive technology? Oh, I haven't seen it offensive, but I think what we've seen is a kind of exporting of a specific technology, internet, cybersecurity kind of mindset, right? So what, you know, we, I don't know if Fadi Shahadi spoke about it, but, you know, this issue about capability building, right, in Africa and other places where all these third world countries were, that are coming online now, you know, the, the U.S., we don't have money for that. Right. We, we, we're doing some of it, but it's pretty small. The Chinese have a lot of money for that, right? And, and Huawei is big uh, in laying, uh, you know, setting up routers and setting up systems in much of the third world. Well, if you have a Huawei guy who's going to be promoting Huawei security measures, uh, it's likely that you're also kind of absorbing Chinese attitudes toward internet governance and other cybersecurity things there. So I think that is a larger issue for the U.S. is that, you know, right now we don't have the resources to compete with that. That's interesting. Big you're saying they're making China's making a big bet on Africa, which many people think is, you know, has the potential of the next China or, or India. I know IBM, for example, is making big bets on, on Africa, and they tend to do so, you know, decades in advance. So interesting to watch. All right, Adam, listen, thanks very much for coming. My you. Great perspectives. Uh, really appreciate it. Okay, everybody, keep it right there. We're right back from MIT and Cambridge, Mass. This is theCUBE. We're live, and we're right back.